Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar session on vaccine communication strategies for underserved populations in rural communities featuring North Country Healthcare in Arizona. We're going to give folks just another minute or so to join, and then we will kick things off shortly. Great, well, we will go ahead and get started with today's session. Welcome everyone. Um, we're really excited to have um, Tammy Howell and Katie Brock here from North Country Healthcare. Um, and we're really excited for all of you who have joined today's presentation. Um, obviously both our current Care Message customers as well as those of you who are just interested in learning more about how an FQHC in Arizona has continued to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic as it relates to their vaccine communication strategy. And today I'm excited to hear both from Tammy Howell, the marketing director, and Katie Brock, um, patient retention specialist from North Country Healthcare. And my name is Jessica Barna. I'm a part of our growth team here at Care Message. And for any of you who are not familiar with Care Message, we're a nonprofit organization that leverages technology to help safety net organizations across the country really just fulfill the essential needs of underserved populations. And we do this primarily with a text-based um, patient communication platform. Uh, and we have you know, FQHCs, free clinics, and other safety net organizations leveraging our platform and delivering at this point over 3 million uh, text messages related to the COVID-19 vaccine itself, which has been um, incredible to see. And so a few quick logistics, please feel free to ask questions during the presentation, especially so you don't forget anything. Um, you can use either the chat or the Q&A box, um, which you should be able to see both um, on your Zoom window. And we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and feel free to direct anything to either Care Message or the North Country team in particular. Um, so with that being said, I will go ahead and pass things off to Tammy. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate it. Um, good morning or afternoon to everyone joining us. Um, we're glad to share our story and our journey through this, um, you know, craziness, all things COVID. Um, as uh, Jessica mentioned, we are a federally qualified health center. We are located in uh, northern Arizona. Our mothership, what we say the main location is in Flagstaff, but we serve 12 communities and you can see there on the map. Um, and we have six counties that we also cover. So um, our service sites, we have brick and mortar locations and we also have two um, mobile units. So you can see a, a picture there of the Sprinter van. We've got one that covers the central region and then we've got one that covers our Western region. Um, um, as you can see, a patient population, um, we've got 155,000 annual visits when we cover a lot of territory. So go ahead, Jessica, and advance the slide. So um, approach to our communication strategies, you know, of course, we utilized our website. We still manage that. There's a main page for all things COVID related. Uh, we've had to develop, of course, talking points, how staff communicate to our patient population. You know, we've had to um, mobilize curbside services, telehealth services, now being part as a vaccination um, distribution partner. So vaccines are new. We also were administering test, testing events, all kinds of things um, happening. Um, and then, uh, of course, um, we had you know, lots of incoming phone calls, as you can imagine, most of you have probably experienced inundated with that. And then luckily we've been able to utilize um, text messages for our communication strategies, which is what we're here to talk about today um, and how we've used that to communicate um, 
our vaccine availability. Go ahead, Jessica, and advance the slide. So um, as you can imagine, our biggest problem and challenge was that we cover six counties. And as most of you know, um, vaccine distribution is based on, you know, comes to the, from the state level, the state level down to the county level, and then county down into the municipalities. And so what was, what's a challenge for us is that every county was in a different phase, had a different mode of distribution. Um, two of the counties in which we serve, we weren't vaccination um, partners. So that made it a challenge because we, um, you know, had to be very strategic and targeted around our communication. We just couldn't communicate to all patient population or community populations equally. Um, go ahead, Jessica, advance the slide. So um, in order to, for us to do this and do targeted communication, we did have to develop, you know, everything run digitally from our website. We had to develop um, a pretty, um, I want to say kind of complicated form, but it had a lot of uh, conditional logic built into it so that we could categorize individuals um, as they were um, inquiring about the vaccine through our site. One thing that I do want to um, highlight is that we did no paid advertising that we were a vaccine um, partner. So we were just a vaccine partner and our URLs to this web page and to our website were all placed on the county um, web pages. So folks were just learning about us when they would go to their county health department web page and knew that we were somebody that they could inquire about getting a vaccine. So we had, as you can see, we were inundated. It was crazy for about three or four weeks, and you know, into January, part of February, and we had had over sixty thousand web form submissions with just in our territory. Um, go ahead, Jessica. And you can, oh, you're good. I guess you could stay on that side. I'm sorry. Um, but any oh, back. Sorry. So. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. And so anyway, so we, um, I, I'm, I apologize here, clicking through, trying to keep track of my notes. So anyway, we tried to um, manage as all of these um, requests were coming through, we had to quickly figure out how to manage, um, you know, the community's requests, as well as um, patient requests. So we had to just begin collecting phone numbers and then utilize care message to communicate back to these phone numbers on um, how we were, you know, our vaccine availability. And, and um, anyway, so right off the bat in the first couple of days, we had received, you know, 10,000 requests. And so we had to quickly put into place these landing pages that would tell folks that we were booked. Um, we had to reroute them back to our county health department. But anyway, over time, what we started to learn is that, you know, our volume and demand for vaccines were hyperinflated. So it was um, very difficult for us to figure out exactly, you know, what the demand was. And so in order to do that, we started to use care message as um, a way to communicate, but with a poll asking individuals, had they gotten their vaccine yet? And if they still, if they had not, if they still wanted their vaccine. That way we had clean lists that we could work from. Um, go ahead, Jessica, I think you can roll right into Katie's portion. Go ahead, Katie. Thanks, Tammy. So as Tammy said, we, we had over 20,000 phone numbers on our wait list between our two largest counties, Coconino and Mojave. And we really needed to get a good handle on how many of these people actually needed a vaccine and see if we could meet that demand. So we sent out a poll to these 20,000 uh, phone numbers in different batches. And we were just basically asking, do you want a vaccine or not? And we found um, pre-poll, before we started sending these polls out, staff were actually picking up the phone and calling people that were on the wait list. And they found that a lot of these people weren't even eligible for the vaccine. Like Tammy said, the list was hyperinflated. People were adding their names and numbers anywhere they could find. So it was just a really, um, wasteful use of our time to pick up the phone, call all these people only to find we couldn't even get them scheduled. So we sent our poll out in different batches. You can see the numbers here. And the most interesting thing on this slide is the second Mojave County finding. 
we went from 88% of people wanted to stay on the list down to 23%. So over time, people are getting vaccinated and it's happening really quickly. You can go to the next slide. So after our initial poll, we began to narrow the list down even further. If patients replied that they wanted to stay on the list, we let them know that we were working through a high volume of requests and that we'd contact them as soon as appointments became available. You can see that under the managing patient expectations example. And as the age groups were adjusted and different counties started to fall into different phases, we sent out more polls related to those specific eligibility requirements. For example, we asked our Mojave County waitlist if they were over the age of 55 and had had or were scheduled to have their vaccine. If they replied yes, we removed them from their list so they wouldn't receive any more communication. And if they replied no, we directed them to a new web form that we created that included screening questions to make sure that they were actually eligible. So once they got through the screening questions, they submitted a web form and then a staff member called them. They knew that that person had been vetted and that they were eligible to receive the vaccine. When forms were submitted, um, a North Country Healthcare, like I said, would employee would contact that patient. The process of picking up a phone to schedule someone isn't the most time effective way. So um, especially for this on-demand appointment type, people really, really wanted this appointment and they wanted it now. Because the demand was so high, we decided it was time to launch patient self-scheduling in our busiest county, Coconino. Go ahead, Jessica. So the goal of this project was to decrease our staff time spent scheduling appointments. Um, it's something that we had talked about for quite some time, many years, this is something we've wanted to do as a marketing department, but due to the complex nature of our schedules, appointment types, provider preferences, we just weren't really sure how to really dive in and tackle this. So when COVID-19 vaccines became available, we thought this appointment type would really allow us to test out self-scheduling in a very controlled and closely monitored way. We selected our Flagstaff 4th Street location as the pilot site it's our largest site, like Tammy said, it's our mothership, and it's in our largest county. Our staff were definitely feeling very overwhelmed by the amount of phone calls that were coming in. They were manually working the wait list. And then they were also receiving incoming appointment request forms that people would submit through our website. So they were really using a lot of their time on this process. We met with our EHR team and they worked quickly to launch this specific site, test it, and you know, as we launched it, of course, there were a few issues here and there, but we worked through those issues and then we started to communicate with our wait list by sending them um, a poll, asking them if they were still interested in receiving a vaccine and then including the link if they replied yes. Since we launched this, we've had over 700 appointments scheduled through easy booking. And I did the math just to kind of see, you know, how much staff time did that really save? I figured about 10 minutes, maybe a little more, maybe a little less per phone call. So we've saved over 116 staff hours by using this self-scheduling template. And it wouldn't be possible without using care message to communicate that to our patient population as well as our community members on the list. Because this Coconino County self-scheduling has been so successful in the utilization utilization of care message. We are actually in the process right now of launching it in our Navajo County region, which is another very large county. Go ahead, Jessica. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about our future initiatives and things that we're working on right now. And um, there'll be a couple more things that I do want to add when I when we talk about setting up these web forms from your website, how important it is, because the, if it weren't for the website, the web forms and the being, being able to communicate using text message, our staff would be critically innovative. Um, and as you know, we have said, we had to communicate to community members and most of us are using care message to communicate to our patient populations where we have all this information um, on a patient and can, you know, tailor messages accordingly, but we couldn't do that with community members. So one thing that we had to do, but we had to communicate with them. As you saw, we had tens of thousands of people 
that needed to be communicated with and we're visible in the community. We just couldn't accept, you know, people putting information on to our website, submitting these forms and us never interacting with these folks again. It would have been just um, peripherally bad, you know, as far as um, community perceptions went. So when we built the lists to be able, because right, we just collected cell phone numbers saying, hey, we'll get back in touch with you when we have appointments available. Um, so all we had was a cell phone number for these individuals. So when we do those uploads into care message to send those out, we had to, you know, have a new ID number assigned, which we created, and also a name for these patients. And we just called everybody COVID Go. And that way we could go back and track and also do list comparison for those that did want the vaccine and didn't want the vaccine, that had already gotten the vaccine. So if you guys have any questions about how we use this just to communicate to the general population, um, we, we can certainly supply you with more information on that. So now where are we is that fast forward, um, you know, two months almost, and now we need to focus on our patient population versus the community, right? Because initially we were part of that big picture in our region, a vaccination partner. And as most of you are probably well aware, our models are not designed for mass vaccination. So there is a lot of adapting that we've had to do within our own systems because we're based on a 15 minute you know, time block and that's how we schedule appointments. And so um, we did have to internally set up um, a mode of having just all nursing visits um, as Katie mentioned, when we opened up the self-scheduling, we had to have a lot of appointment availability on our calendars for that. So those internal um, workflows did have to be modified and changed into a mass kind of situation, service situation versus um, those that can walk in or the, the traditional doctor appointment visit time. So anyway, as now that we focus on our current patient population, we need to know who has and has not had a vaccine. Now for the state of Arizona, we've got a vaccination um, platform that we all track our vaccines in. Most other states have them too. It's called ACES here in the state of Arizona. And we have no way of knowing rather than going into ACES, how our, if our patients have had or had not had the vaccine because that's how it's all tracked. We can't track it internally. Um, it gets very complicated to know for sure if they've had it. It can cause duplicated tickets, et cetera. It's, it's very cumbersome. So from a marketing standpoint, what we use to determine a well-established patient, right? We want to communicate to our patient population. We, we say anybody that has had two or more visits in the last 18 months. That helps us kind of signal these are probably chronic condition patients or patients that have made good on coming back for follow-up, et cetera. So that's who we began to target. Again, in specific counties, um, as Katie had indicated, we have counties that are very complicated because they don't have a vaccine supply like they do in other counties. So it sounds like it's it's very, you know, um, kind of a spaghetti bowl, sort of, so to speak, of how we can track and target um, specific individuals. Because counties, and as you know now with the president, they are bypassing phases. We bypassed for Arizona phase 1C, which was chronic conditions. We just went straight from the last phase 1B of um, those um, in specific job roles to now anybody 18 and over. So, and 16 and over in some locations that have the Pfizer. We are administering um, the um, Moderna and we have a small supply of the Janssen that we're using for our homeless population or special populations. So that's where we're at right now. We can now communicate with these patients. We began that communication this, this week, um, our well-defined um, or well-established patients. Um, so that's, we're trying to communicate whether or not they've had the vaccine. Um, we have talked about and will look at for future is using that Azara care message integration, um, the kind of the set it and forget it model that they have set up. We use that, we're using that for um, certain other population health, but we would look into using that possibly for vaccine moving forward. And I, for us, we're going to have to be in a phase of vaccine distribution where it's going to be blanketed pretty much the same across all regions 
for patient population for that communication to make sense because the communication we don't want to go out to a region where we don't have either vaccine stock or as of right now some of we've got one county that's lagging a little bit behind on the distribution age um, and then also another strategy is that we need to figure out how to incorporate the vaccine distribution into our regular events so for example a lot of events that we are hosting we do um, maybe a back to school event where we could capture um, some of the kids coming in later. Right now, how about um, we're using, um, we've got mammography and mammogram events happening. Um, so those well woman events, and we can incorporate it into those. We've also got diabetes events that are happening and nutrition events, et cetera. So now we can try and figure out a way to just get shots in arms through some of those other methods of um, and then also definitely through well exams. Okay, I think I covered it. Katie, do you have anything to add? No, I think you did cover it, Tammy. The only addition I had was the well exams. That's something that we're also definitely working on is making sure as folks are scheduled for their annual well exam, um, we're very in tune with their vaccine status and we'll give it to them if they need it. Awesome. Thank you both for sharing um, some of these really helpful insights in terms of your communication strategy and also these future initiatives and things you're exploring as an organization. It's really helpful to hear. Um, I wanted to just briefly share, um, as some of you who are on um, today's session might already be aware of, we do have a publicly available um, COVID-19 vaccine message library. And these messages have been developed specifically for safety net organizations to be able to leverage, um, especially uh, I think even some of the messages, Katie, that you shared, um, some of the templates that you shared um, were from that library. Um, and so in order to be able to create these messages in December um, and really in response to to the development and distribution of the vaccine um, late last year, we as a team sought out the guidance from a group of experts who you know, were working with underserved population in epidemiology, vaccinology, and public health really to, in, in, to provide um, recommended vaccination messaging to safety net organizations across the country. So like I said, in December, we launched our vaccine advisory board. Um, and this consists of six experts that you can see pictured here. Um, who all oversee our vaccine messaging content that we share publicly, um, which I will share with everyone after today's session, um, to really help strategize culturally appropriate vaccine education um, for underserved populations in particular. And so in collaboration with our vaccine advisory board, we really leverage each person's expertise to help us take into consideration, okay, what are the historical challenges and barriers for underserved populations in particular to be able to receive vaccinations and specifically the COVID-19 vaccine and really design content that would be valuable for, you know, FQHCs, free clinics and safety net organizations across the country to be able to leverage to better inform patients. And so, for example, um, our vaccine advisory board has helped us really think more critically about wording and phrasing. And I'm sure Tammy and Katie, you all have considered this as well of just, um, okay, how do we word and phrase our messages to our patients um, that, that we're sharing to them? And so uh, one thing that the care message team was thinking about is our in our initial messages, we were thinking about um, saying content around, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine is safe. And one of our vaccine advisory board members gave us the recommendation and feedback to actually update that message instead of saying the COVID-19 vaccine is safe to say the COVID-19 vaccine is very safe. I'm really emphasizing that safety to a lot of people as a continuum. And by including very safe, I'm really reinforcing the efficacy of the vaccine. So overall, these individuals have been extremely helpful in the developing of our development of our messaging content. And I will certainly be sure, be sure to share the link to those templates out to everyone in case anyone wants to leverage those messages. Hey, Jessica, this is Tammy real quick. I did want to add something that you said to that. Um, Absolutely. That 
We um, have also set up Spanish first language lists as well when we're talking about reaching our targeted population, patient specific populations. Um, so we are sending messages to those individuals. The other tool that we also use to complement um, care message as well as our website is a tool that um, for call tracking, we port our own phone numbers into this platform. Um, we use call, um, call rail in particular. And so what that allows us to do is that we can set up an internal round robin um, with our organization and those that speak Spanish, we have family health advocates. If we put the phone number into the care message, Spanish first language care message, we put in this, this, that special phone number, that phone number will only ring to our family health advocates that speak Spanish. So those individuals can have, you know, a you know, conversation with folks and kind of that kick glove care to get that special population scheduled. Uh, so anyway, if any of you out there um, have an opportunity to use a platform like that, um, I highly recommend it. The other thing that we're able to do on the back end is that we can track exactly how many phone calls we've had. It helps us close the loop on whether or not these patients have been assisted. Because you're right, the challenge initially was just everything was digital. So we know that there's pockets of our patient population that are homebound or that aren't technically savvy or even have poor um, internet access that can't utilize all the digital tools that make things easy. So that's the other reason why we are circling back and targeting these just special patient populations. That's all I had to say. About awesome, that. Thanks. thanks for including that, Tammy. That's really helpful, I'm sure, for folks to hear. Um, and kind of the one other thing I'll just add, and really, Tammy, it touches on what you just shared as well towards the end, but um, this is a really, really quick and surface level view of the just the overall process that goes into um, as a care message internal team, as we create publicly available message templates before we add them into our message library. Um, this is kind of the overarching process that we go through. Um, so we continue to really have in, internal conversations, both with our, our customers and then analyzing current literature to really help pro, as proactively as possible provide um, communication tools to any safety net organization. And so kind of hearing from, you know, like Tammy, hearing from Tammy and Katie on what's going on um, in their organization and being able to both anticipate needs that come up for your teams, as it relates to various topics, um, open eligibility, things of that nature, but also, um, you know, just just providing, continuing to provide content um, that anyone can leverage. And so, once that top the topics and kind of messenger messages are drafted, then we submit those both um, internally. We get internal feedback, and then we submit those to our vaccine advisory board for approval. Um, you know, going through the process, like I shared in the last slide of you know, those experts being able to give feedback on the actual content and words within the messages. And then following that feedback and approval, we'll actually refine those messages further. Um, and then we'll submit those messages um, internally to one of our translators to translate those messages into culturally relevant Spanish. Um, and the reason why we I'll just emphasize this quickly, and Tammy, I'm sure you'd agree, um, around the importance of translations and that um, at Care Message, we put so much emphasis in our translations that um, they are culturally relevant, that we can't just copy and paste into Google Translate or any other translation platform, um, just to take into consideration the nuances of um, the various Spanish languages um, and things of that nature. So. We, all of our templates are available in both English and Spanish um, for that purpose. And then I will share one quick example um, and then we'll go into Q&A, but in this message example, um, as a team, we're just thinking of ways that how can we take steps to try and address any lack of confidence in the vaccine that your patients may have previously expressed. So on our end, we've seen you know, many health centers send the, you know, a yes or no question to patients, just asking if they're interested in, in getting the vaccine. And, you know, obviously if a patient 
responds yes to that message, the next step is self-explanatory to either you know, schedule that appointment or add them to your wait list. But for those patients who respond, no, I'm actually not interested in getting the vaccine, the next step might be a bit unclear, um, you know, whether they already received the vaccine or there's, you know, there's another reason behind that. And so this is a multiple choice, what we call an outreach question that would be sent to a large group of patients who said no to that initial message that could be used um, once, once you, like I said, once you receive some sort of indication that there is a lack of confidence in the vaccine. Um, and you know what you'd be trying to do here is really understand, okay, well, what are your patient's top concerns as it relates to the vaccine? And then be able to provide them with some additional information and even give them your phone number, you know, whether a phone number or um, some sort of contact information to discuss further. Um, and so this might also be a good place instead of a phone number to place a link to your website. Uh, as I'm sure everyone's experiencing high call volumes, it might be more applicable to um, include a link to your to your website or, or a landing page. Um, and so all of this to say is if you know, you're interested in using Care Message, we still have our a free CM Lite platform available to send messages like this to your patients. Um, I, will, I will include all of the resources that I've mentioned um, and the recording to this presentation um, via email to everyone tomorrow, but please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions, um, both now and after the session today. Jessica, can I add something to that yes. slide back there? I just, it would just seems timely also to chime in a little bit. Um, this is probably a phase that many of us are in right now. Um, as we had mentioned, you know, we're trying to figure out, we've got some great analytics right now on how we're targeting our current patient population. We are finding that a majority of our patient population, depending on the area, one has already had the vaccine. Coconino County is an area where 70% of our current patient population, the findings this week have been vaccinated. But then we get into our Eastern region we have Apache and Navajo counties. These are areas that are more conservative in nature. Um, they are a little more timid about the actual vaccine. So what we're finding in that area is that about 49%, 48% um, have had the vaccine. And we've got 52% that don't want the vaccine. They don't trust it. So that's kind of, I think, probably nationally where a lot of us are definitely here in the state of Arizona. Um, because anybody that wants the vaccine at a state level can get it, basically, just mm -hmm. get in line. Um, so now we are moving into that phase of helping to folks to understand the effect, the effectiveness and safety of the vaccine. So this is something, you know, here is probably where our next steps are in our vaccination communication strategy. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, so thank you for that. Uh -huh. Tammy, one quick question, just while we're on this topic, but are there any kind of specific, I know when we covered your future initiatives, um, kind of as it relates to addressing a lack of confidence or continued education, I guess, are, is there anything top of mind for you all in, in kind of continuing education as, you know, as you continue to reach out to patients? Yes, and that is just as this, the safety of the, that the vaccine is safe and effective. Um, we've actually, this week, are receiving calls from other smaller um, nonprofits or supporting organizations in our communities asking if we've created collateral, if they want to communicate to their clients on the safety of the vaccine. Um, so I think that it, if I'm understanding your question correctly, I think the next phase of promotion is definitely communicating the safety of the vaccine. And I would say even the other piece is those that have had the virus feel that they might have a natural immunity to it. However, you know, the CDC recommends that after that 60 day exposure or 60 days after clearing the, the virus, those should be vaccinated as well. So now we've got to communicate to yeah. those that have had the vaccine. I mean, I'm sorry, that have had the virus, um, that it's safe and then those that are leery of it. So I would say if you wanted to break that out into two targeted groups, it's, it's gonna be those folks. Mm. Well, that's great. Thank you for, for sharing that. Awesome. Well, we will kind of pivot into q and I will, even though um, we've already answered one question just over the chat, I think it's still worth um, 
I can read it aloud just for um, Katie, if you want to answer it. But um, one individual asked for uh, Mojave County, may I ask what was the time difference between those two batches of text polls um, and ask, asking whether patients still wanted to remain on the wait list. And just to remind everyone, that was the example where the, the percentage of interest in or needing the vaccine or to be on the vaccine wait list dropped from what is about 80, 88% down to 23% for that county. Um, so what was the time difference between those, those two messages, two batches? It was just about five weeks, uh, close, yeah, close to a month and a half. So it, it happened really quickly. People were getting vaccinated and um, it gave us the opportunity to signif significantly clean up our wait list and um, remove quite a few people. And are you guys continuing to do um, those sort of outreaches, you know, incrementally over, you know, a, a four or five week period or just done those two? So that's a great question. We actually completed our wait list communication last week. We had, I want to say, gosh, about 12,000 people that we need to, needed to communicate with. And we um, either routed them to our new forum in Mojave County where we had our staff calling them uh, because they didn't have self-scheduling or we linked all the people in Coconino County directly to self-scheduling. Mm -hmm. So what we're finding is if they didn't act on it immediately, you know, they still have that link in their text thread and they can go back and schedule their vaccine at any time they they feel ready. Awesome. And Jessica, we can share the link if anybody's interested in looking at how we're using, you know, that web base, if they wanted to try it themselves and how we're using the forms and using our website, I can put our link in the chat if people are interested in seeing it and they can kind of go through the process and understand what we were talking about when we were validating folks and ensuring the fact that they were true candidates as Katie had indicated we had people at the time that weren't that were ineligible for the vaccine but were trying to get on vaccine schedules. Um, is that okay if yeah. I share Absolutely please share it. You can share it in the chat and then I'll also include it um, in the webinar follow-up as well. You, and you might have to adjust it to go to everyone. Did you guys see that come through? I just You have to adjust it to go. It just went to to me. But oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. Awesome. While well, Tammy sends that, are there any other questions that any folks have, or just um, anything that are even differences within your own health center that you've been seeing, challenges that you've been seeing that we can speak to as well? Um, all comments and questions are welcome. While we oh, wait. Thank you so much. Um, Jessica, just on um, behalf of myself and Katie and North Country Healthcare, we thank you so much for letting us share our story. And if anybody has any questions in a couple of days or next week or in a month, please reach out. Um, we've always got new things that we're working on and testing, and, and um, we're happy to help in any way we can. Absolutely. Thank you both for joining. And yes, if anyone has any questions, Come in, you can feel free. I'll, like I said, I will directly email each of you with the recording and some of the resources that were shared um, during today's webinar. And if there are any questions that come up for both Tammy and Katie, then I can forward those along to both of them. Um, so if anything comes up, please let us know. But that being said, I don't think we have any additional questions coming through. Just a few thank yous to you all. Um, and Yes, my sincere thank you for joining us for this session and yeah, really inspired by all the work that you've been doing um, over the last few months and even, even before that, but especially during this time. So thank you both for sharing and excited to continue to work with you both moving forward. Great, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone, bye.